hello everyone welcome back to New Zealand and world mysteries for a great video today I am talking about Michael McGrath from Christchurch he's been or his case has been in the news a lot lately um, I was waiting for a bit of an outcome to come <laughs> um, and it has so I thought now is a good time to look at his case it's gonna be a long one grab what you need your snacks your coffee whatever um, and settle in I'm gonna read you some stuff tell you a story so let's go so firstly let's just look at uh, I'll bring up a Google map and we're just gonna show which areas we're talking about so we're getting down here in Christchurch in the South Island if we get a bit closer uh, his house was over here in Horswell and there is some talk about uh, this Ellesmere place as well so sort of that side of town now this is interesting the first place I'm going to go is my very own website because I have some great uh, information on there believe it or not if you want to go to the website it's in the description box below along with Facebook YouTube Twitter podcast and please if you can donate uh, even just a three dollar coffee that really helps me I need better equipment um, and I need help let's get into this so it's at New Zealand missing dot and we're talking about Michael McGrath date of birth uh, well he was aged 49 he went disappearing on um, the 21st of May 2017 and he's a European we're gonna pretend we never seen that um, so yeah date of disappearance 21st of May 2017 from his home in Chickens Ave Christchurch Michael left his home in Chickens Ave Horswell Christchurch on May 21st 2017 two days later when he failed to turn up for dinner with his mum which was his normal routine the family went to Michael's house they found the house locked with his wallet and cash inside Michael's blue 1994 Subaru Legacy was parked in the driveway the car was normally parked in the garage so they found that odd his bike was also left inside push bike his phone had not been used since and his bank account has not been touched operation renovation was launched when his family reported him missing please go on to it quite quick they were seeking any sightings of Michael police inquiries centered on a person of interest from the beginning of the investigation on 31st of May police started a search of this person's home and the home of his mother the search would last 14 days it would later be reported that this person held a firearms license and a rifle belonging to them appeared to be missing in June of that year 2017 flyers were distributed to shops and pubs throughout Horswell and police divers searches uh, the Horswell waterways Michael's family and friends also delivered flyers around the Horswell areas now I remember uh, when he was missing it was actually all over the news it was quite confronting I don't live in that part of town but it was everywhere and there's so many cases that I've covered in New Zealand that that doesn't happen so it is what it is on June 15th police began to search the Cate Valley landfill in Wipera it was reported that the police spent 6,000 hours over 70 days and searched through 2,700 tons of rubbish about 300 items were taken from the landfill and a selection of items would be sent to ESR which if you're not in New Zealand it's environmental shit I've forgotten <laughs> scientific research or something like that it's basically our DNA place and in, in, in that um, I will get the uh, name in my head a dedicated phone line was set up for info it was 0800 find Michael and police appealed for sightings of a late 1990s silver Toyota Camry several weeks into the investigation police sought help from an international expert Australian Federal Police Commander Mark Harrison police announced that they had identified areas of interest in the Greater Christchurch Lincoln Horsville and Ellesmere which I showed you um, on the map before police conducted area inquiries of hundreds of homes around Horsville and wider Christchurch 
Police reviewed CCTV from all major businesses in the area. Thousands of leaflets were distributed across Lincoln, Selwyn and Banks Peninsula. So if we look at the map again, um, all around here, um, around here, I think that's where they were looking the most. Police had sightings of interest and significance for the investigation from May 31st through May 22. The sightings included Michael's Blue Subaru Legacy and a silver 1999 silver, well, I've said silver twice, Toyota Camry. Police seized and searched a silver Camry Toyota which was dropped off at a Horswell panel, beat, panel beaters between May 21st and 23rd and then returned to its owner. Police revealed that the person of interest owns a similar car. Michael's disappearance was, uh, was aired on Police 107. That's basically a crime watch show here in New Zealand. Michael's brother Simon posted a moving tribute to Michael on his Facebook page, which we will actually look at as we keep going. Uh, a dedicated phone line, we said that. Now, this is a photo that they captured of Michael in New World. Okay. Let's keep going. So this is police.govt.nz, the police website. And we're going to look at this. It was 31st of May 2017. Uh, let's go. I've been playing with my settings on the uh, software I use and I'm not really good at it. So actually Michael looks a bit red, but that's all right. Christchurch Police have today executed a number of search warrants in relation to Michael Craig McGrath, who was reported missing on 23rd of May 2017. Two Christchurch properties in the suburb of Horsball will be forensically examined by specialists, including the ESR in the coming days, along with two motor vehicles. Today's activities signal that police now have serious concerns about his well-being. Investigations this week, including speaking with his family and friends and the scene examination of Michael's home address in Checkers Avenue, indicate that his absence is completely out of character. Michael's whereabouts remains unknown. The police are seeking sightings of him in the Horsell area of Christchurch or any other suburb. At this point, the investigation and scene examinations are ongoing. Police are not in a position to discuss any further details at this time but they are seeking however any sightings of Michael's blue 1994 Subaru station wagon in Christchurch over the weekend 21st of May through to the 23rd. <clears throat> any sightings or interactions that anyone has had with Michael over that period um, we would like to hear from anyone that Michael has completed any contract building work for over this period or any <clears throat> info that from anyone that may insist the investigation. Police will continue to maintain a visible presence in the Christchurch suburb of Horswell and they have numbers down the bottom where you would ring if you did, which I'm going to have in the description box below anyway. So you'll be able to ring uh, if you have any information. Okay, now we are on uh, facebook.com. Of course, uh, this is New Zealand Mysteries and we shouldn't be on this page, but give me one second and we will be. But why don't you go to New Zealand Mysteries anyway on Facebook? I need to change my name and um, follow or like or share. I can't remember what it is, but do one of those things. So now, again, we are going to Facebook and this is Simon McGrath, his brother page. And it mentioned in the first part I read about something he wrote. So I just wanted to read it. Bro, it's been over four months since I last saw you, but it seems just like yesterday. Now the days drift on and on and nothing is and will ever be the same. When you were around, there was always a degree of expectancy. Reflections of the good times we had and of what future projects you were scheming up. Now all I am left with is the everlasting memories and possibilities of what could have been. Rest in peace, the sun will set for you. Uh, that's very, very moving and um, has me a bit teary actually. But again, reason why I do this for family members, um, we want information, we want awareness. 
um, and we want to give them a voice. Okay, let's move on to the pressreader.com. This is quite a, a good article, so listen up, huh? <laughs> Two years after Michael McGrath's mysterious disappearance, his brother says there's unfinished business, as in the investigation into what happened continues. The 45, uh, sorry, 49-year-old disappeared from his home May 21st, 2017. He left without his car or his bike and was never seen again. He was reported to missing, uh, missing two days later uh, after he failed to meet mum for dinner. His brother Simon McGrath told the press it had been a very long two years dealing with the aftermath of such a horrible situation. The nature of the event and memories I have especially of the night I found out he was missing will haunt me forever. Uh, you know, <clears throat> When you think of it, the victims, not the victims, but the families left behind, which which are victims, the families left behind, for the rest of their natural life, they have to deal with this. Those are great burdens for people. Very, very sad. Time invariably moves on. The scars will always be there, and yet there is still unfinished business of which we hope to get answers for. He earlier told the press he believed the person responsible for his brother's disappearance would go to the grave without telling a soul. They might think they have got away with it, but there's still work being done by the police. I guess we will just have to wait and see. The police keep telling us they're making progress. How would you know? You've just got to trust them. Detective Inspector Kylie something said a team of investigators were actively looking into the circumstances of, of his disappearance. They had the dedicated phone line. It was still in action two years later. I have no idea, but I doubt it. I absolutely doubt that it's doing it. And police are doing everything to find out what happened. The police inquiry dubbed Operation Renovation, as Michael was renovating his home when he disappeared, started with police setting up an army-style tent outside his three-bedroom home, door-knocking his neighbours and searching nearby reserves. They soon focused on a friend, a childhood friend of his. David Charles Benlo Benbo, they seized Benbo's car and spent 10 days searching his home and his mum's home. They spent a further uh, 70 days sifting through 2,700 tonnes of rubbish at the Cape Valley Landfill near Waipara. It is understood Bimbo, who you can see on screen, I'm not sure which way, oh, below me, below me. Um, it is understood Bimbo went to a transfer station, which is rubbish tip, and Parkhouse Road, Sockburn, to dump a small quantity of rubbish soon after Michael's disappearance. The press previously revealed a rifle belonging to Bimbo, a licensed firearms holder, is actually missing. The press has visited Bimbo, who quit his job as a prison guard at Christchurch Men's Prison in July last year several times. He earlier confirmed he was the last known person to see Michael alive on May 21st and claimed he was the victim of a witch hunt by media and police. He said, the nature of the event and the memories I have, especially of the night I found out, sorry, that's not from him, that's from his brother. Um, the nature of the event and the memories I have, especially of the night I found out he was missing, will haunt me forever. Very, very sad. We are going to nzherald.co.nz. Uh, Horswell, Christchurch murder trial. So we've moved on a bit and there's a trial. Police tracked suspect David Bembo as they investigated Michael's disappearance. This is a long one, so make sure you've got your ears on and everything you need. Detectives snuck a secret tracking device beneath a murder suspect's car after making a tactical media release about a global search expert's help, hoping he would lead them to a dumped body, a court heard today. Ex-prison officer David Bembo is standing trial for the alleged murder of Christchurch builder Michael McGrath, 
who disappeared from his home in May 2017. His body has never been found and nor has a uh, murder weapon. Despite vast Canterbury-wide police searches that included officers spending two months scouring an enormous lounge full site. Dump, really. David Bimbo, 54, was arrested more than two years later and has always professed his innocence. Today, at the High Court in Christchurch, a seven-week murder trial finally began before a jury of seven men, seven men and five women. His defence team, Bembo's defence team, warned the jury of investigators' bias and tunnel vision from police early in its probe. In an opening address, Mark Hawley, King's counsel, said that within hours of Michael's disappearance, his ex-partner, who Bembo's ex-partner, his ex-girlfriend, who was in a new relationship with Michael, had pointed the finger of blame at Bembo, and the police duly obliged. So what had happened uh, is David Bembo and Michael McGrath uh, childhood friends apparently. This lady was with Bembo and then he'd left her, uh, him and actually was in a new relationship with Michael. But despite teams of police spending thousands of hours investigating trying to find any evidence they could to fit their theory, they could not find any. Issues of a particular witness and CCTV evidence that the Crown will say puts Michael at David Bembo's house on the morning he was allegedly killed was also flagged up by the defence, with Callit warning the jury not to swallow whole the Crown story. The Crown gave an opening address that outlined its case against David Bembo, alleging that he murdered his old schoolmate Michael just weeks after finding out he was seeing his ex-partner and telling a counsellor that he wanted to annihilate him. After spending days plotting and preparing, David Bembo had the motive, means and opportunity to kill Mr McGrath, the Crown Prosecutor told the court. Bembo went to McGrath's house on Sunday May 21st and asked if he'd help him shift some heavy railway sleepers the following morning at a semi-rural livestock box. In an hour or so window, it's the Crown case that David Bembo used his 22 semi-automatic rifle with suppressor and subsonic ammunition to murder Michael and then dispose of his body. While the Crown accepts there is no body, no murder weapon and little forensic evidence in the case, it says there is a strong circumstantial case consisting of many threads that when taken together show Bembo is guilty of his murder, Michael's murder, beyond reasonable doubt. So um, I'm going to pause and look up how many jury trials have been in New Zealand with no body. Give me a minute. Actually, there's been one, two, three, four, and it says one more row, so that'll be five. Very interesting. I know that uh, in the States, it's getting more common, but I didn't realise how common it was here. As the, invest, as the police investigation into Michael's disappearance progressed, David Bembo became a person of interest, and in July 2018, officers put a covert tracking device on his Toyota Camry. It came after releasing a tactical media statement which said police were working with an international search expert and had identified geographical areas of interest in the Greater Christchurch area that specialist search teams would focus on. The court heard that the tracking devices logged daily summaries showing a consistent pattern of movements for Bembo around Horsell and its surrounds, visiting friends, family, the supermarket and the petrol station. Other trips outside of town were backed up by intercepted voice calls. So it's very interesting they were doing all this like spy stuff. <laughs> um, with the, uh, uh, obviously they were tracking his calls as well as his car. They say about 7.50pm on August 6, David drove to a rural address in Mochi Karara and stopped for more than two minutes. On the following morning, he allegedly drove to the same area and stopped at two other spots. So let's have a look where this is. Machu Karara. Oh, oh, eh, eh. 
copy. Don't worry about that. Let's put in Mochikara. Oh, yep, yeah, here we go. Even I didn't know that, right? But there it is. Even I didn't know that. These, oh, they were the only times he went to that area in five months of surveillance, the Crown said. Boschier posited, posited, posted, he posited, I don't know what the hell that means, whether Bembo was checking the area to see if police had gone there searching for the body. Okay, so that's what they thought. Police searched sections of the Horsell River and surrounding wetlands but found nothing with Boshia liking it to finding a needle in a haystack. The court heard how David Bembo had allegedly been devastated after learning that Joanna Green, I shouldn't have said her name, his partner of 17 years, had taken their two children and left him earlier in 2017. And when one of his children had told him they had seen Mummy and Mike kissing on April 30th, his world changed. Two days later, after calling in sick at his job, Christchurch Prison, Bembo visited a counsellor to speak about his breakup, saying he was lost and lonely. So there's definitely evidence of him being quite broken up about it. He said his health was deteriorating and he couldn't sleep or eat. He said, or Bembo the Crown says, also spoke about the assets he'd had with her, including three rental properties, and that he felt shafted, something the councillor had underlined in her notes. Um, I didn't know about, you know how when you talk to lawyers, uh, no one's allowed, to, the lawyers aren't allowed to say anything. I thought it was the same way when you talk to a councillor or a psychologist or psychiatrist, but it appears here the councillor is uh, able to share with police um, what was told. He also allegedly told the councillor that one of his mates was seeing uh, her now and that he wanted to annihilate him. Over the summer of 2016 and 17, Bembo had hired his mate Michael, a carpenter who did cash jobs for friends and through word of mouth to build a large new deck at their Candies Road family home. It was a big job that the meticulous and exacting builder took months to complete. Later, David Bembo would say to friends that he suspected something was going on between Michael and Green while he was away in Wellington, training to become a corrections officer. The Crown alleges after finding out about the relationship, he started to plan to kill Michael. It is alleged that Bembo turned off the CCTV at his Candies Road property, something he was obsessed with. Boshia said so that his comings and goings in the weeks he was finalising his plan were not recorded. Bembo would later tell police that McGrath never showed up. But the Crown says CCTV cameras and a witness show that Michael did keep his word and that day and showed up around 9am. So every time I pause to have uh, um, a vape, I come back on and all you see is all this vape. I'm not catching on fire, guys. <laughs> um, so, on that day, Bembo was late for a 10am counselling appointment in Rickerton, the Crown alleged, alleges. Exactly what he did in that hour when he murdered McGrath is not knowing, Boshia told the court. What is known, the Crown says, is that Bembo's legally purchased 22 semi-automatic rifle, which he said was secured in his roof space, is missing. The use of such a low power rifle along with suppressor and subsonic ammunition, ammunition would not make much of a noise. Boshia said rather it would be more akin to a click. And .22 calibre bullets do not usually exit a body, the prosecutor said, nor would there be a large dispersal of blood or bone fragments at the scene. It's a bit gross, isn't it? The Crown alleges that on his way back from his counselling session, Bembo bought a packet of grass seed along with more petrol. When police examined Candy's Road, parts of the lawn around the deck area had been dug out and fresh grass seed sown despite it being nearly winter I myself don't know what that's about, but yeah, okay. It was a place he had selected carefully and had time to prepare, Boshia told the jury. 
Massive searches for Michael around waterways around Horswell were conducted by police along with the landfill, the dump. After it was established, Bembo went to the City Council uh, Refuse Centre the day after it's alleged he killed Michael but his body has never been found. Michael's bank accounts have not been touched since his disappearance. David Benbow hardly used his cell phone on May 21st, 22nd and 23rd of 2017, the Crown says. Boschia highlighted a couple of interesting internet searches, including on May 21st, what are the organs of the human body? Which is a weird internet search and later a search for a map of the Lincoln area. This afternoon, the court heard from the trial's first witness, Simon, which is his brother of Michael, who described Michael as a gifted, hard-working builder, all-around good guy and dependable and a creature of habit. On Tuesday, May 23rd, when Michael didn't show up for his usual dinner at their mum's house in Horswell, he thought it was unusual. Within minutes, Green... The, the, the lady that used to see Bembo and that now is seeing Michael had phoned his mother saying she thought something had happened to Michael and that Dave had done something. She or they had to break into Michael's locked house and when he was not found inside they phoned police who suggested they go to the station to make a report. On the way she phoned David, Simon McGrath said and she asked what he had done with Michael. As soon as she ended the call, she phoned someone else to check out his story, Simon said. When she hung up, she said, he's a lying bastard, he told the court. The trial uh, continues. Um, yeah, wow. So, onenews.co.nz, um, deliberations begin on whether Christchurch man murdered his mate. So... I mean, this is March 29th, uh, last week, 2023. The jury has retired in the murder trial of 54-year-old Christchurch prison guard David Benbow, accused of uh, murdering his friend. He's accused of murdering Horswell builder Michael McGrath in a fit of anger and jealousy after discovering he was a, in a relationship with his ex-partner Joe Green. The body of the alleged victim has never been found. The 22 rifle, the Crown says, was used as a murder weapon is missing and no forensic evidence was found at David's house where police say he was killed. In the High Court at Christchurch, Justice Jonathan Eaton summed up the case for the jury. You must put aside all feelings of emotion, whether they be sympathy or prejudice. Sympathy for Mr McGrath and his family a family who haven't seen their son for six years and believe that he is dead but don't know where he is. Sympathy for Miss Green. Sympathy for David's children. Sympathy for Mr Benmore and the predicament he faces. All those feelings must be put aside as must feelings of prejudice. Prejudice particularly against a person who was accused of killing someone else. Both mothers, family and friends of the alleged victim and the accused killer sat on opposite sides of the public gallery throughout the trial. In summing up the Crown case, Justice Eaton told the jury, The Crown say David Bembo had every reason to be angry and upset and motivated to cause harm to Michael. You know the last known arrangement by Michael was for the two men to meet at 9am at Candies Road on the 22nd of May. The Crown case is they did meet there. Michael McGrath has not been seen since and the only logical and reasonable explanation is that David Bembo had killed him. He then summarised the defence case. The defence say the Crown case alleged Michael McGrath was murdered by David Bembo shortly after 9am on 22nd of May has been completely answered by the electricity evidence. Now, I'm not going to play this video because I'll probably get a copyright strike, which I don't need. But, of course, if you want to um, watch it, description box below, source link. If you accept Mr. Beatty's opinion and you find that Mr. McGrath was still at home using electricity in his home after 9am, then every other aspect simply falls away. 
that's the defence case. Justice Eaton told the jury they should not be motivated by a desire to hold someone accountable for Mr McGrath's disappearance. I think that's a great summing up by the judge, um, especially when emotions are involved. I've never been on jury duty. Have any of you been on jury duty before? Tell me in the description box below. I've never been on it. I think, like, it would be really interesting to sit on a case, but really emotional and hard as well, I think. All right. Let's look here. This is the last uh, article, and I know you guys have been really listening hard, and this is a long one, but there's just so much information. nzherald.co.nz Hung jury and trial of former Christchurch prison guard David Bembo, who was accused of murdering friend. So we find out on the 3rd of April, hung jury. We'll play a little of this one with no sound. This is um, leaving the court. A jury considering whether a former prison guard murdered his longtime friend has been unable to reach a verdict. The hung jury had been deliberating for 23 hours over four days in the case of David Bembo, 54, standing trial for the alleged murder of Michael McGrath in 2017. The trial at the High Court in Christchurch has heard from more than 100 witnesses over the last seven weeks, but the jury today said that it could not reach a unanimous decision and were discharged by Justice Jonathan Eaton, and he thanked the jury for their service. Bembo showed no emotion as the news emerged, nor when the hung jury walked out of the court. He declined to comment to journalists outside court. He was remanded on electronically monitored bail and will be back in court on May 19th to decide what happens next with the case. His uh, McGrath's brother, Simon, said he was disappointed the jury was unable to reach a verdict. Friends and family members, including uh, McGrath's parents, his brother Simon, as well as David's mum and brother, had packed into courtroom 12's public gallery along operation renovation detectives for the tense moment. The jury of seven men and five women began its deliberations at 12.48pm last Wednesday, coming back each day to resume their task and then breaking for the weekend. In addressing the jury before they began their closed door discussions, Justice Eaton reminded them that it was a trial by jury, not trial by experts. They returned with several questions over that period, including a clarification over what constitutes reasonable doubt. Justice Eaton told them that the Crown would only have met the beyond reasonable doubt threshold if they were sure that Mr Bembo is guilty of murder. Monday morning, the jury had another query, this time telling the judge that they were having difficulty in reaching a unanimous verdict. Justice Eaton gave them a majority verdict direction, saying that if they reached a point where 11 of them agreed with one juror disagreeing, then they could proceed to a verdict. However, he said if they didn't have at least 11 in agreement, they could not come to a decision. But after 23 hours, they were still at an impasse and the hung jury decision was made. Justice Eaton said there would likely be another trial. The judge also thanked both sets of lawyers in what he acknowledged had been a long and difficult trial where everyone worked extremely hard to present a complicated case to the jury. Everyone will be sharing in a sense of frustration that it hasn't resulted in a conclusion today. So this just, well, I'm going to miss a little bit here because we've read this bit like five or six times. A missing persons investigation which became a homicide, homicide probe within days was launched when McGrath, a fastidious carpenter, failed to show up for mum's dinner. David Bembo became an interest uh, to, quite early on and he was the last person to see him. Uh, he said he went to the house on Monday 21st to ask him for help shifting some heavy railway sleepers the next morning. David has always professed his innocence, saying that Michael never turned up that morning, putting it down to a hard frost, and while waiting a while went to a counsellor's appointment in the city at 10.15am. 
During the trial, his lawyers claimed that the police had investigative bias and tunnel vision from early in its investigations. With no body, no murder weapon and little forensic evidence, the Crown, meanwhile, had relied on circumstantial. In his clothing and dress on Tuesday, Lead Defence Counsel Mark Call it, uh, King's counsel told the jury that the question of whether Michael turned up at David's home or not on the morning of May 22 was the crux of the case. If Mr McGrath did not come around to David's house that Monday morning, then Mr Benbo is in no better position than anyone else in this room to tell what has become of him. He went through aspects of the case. Power usage records, which he said poured doubt over whether, uh, whether Michael was actually at home at the time the Crown says he was killed kilometres away. CCTV evidence, sorry, I'm like mouth mushing, <coughs> excuse me. CCTV evidence that allegedly showed Michael driving towards David's house and a key Crown witness sighting of two men matching the descriptions of Michael and David on the morning of the alleged murder. The current case is on fire in the dumpster. The electricity evidence they relied on is wrong, 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 call it said. The only way the Crown can deal with that problem is hurl a grenade at the dumpster fire and pretend none of that happened. Call it also asked the jury why McGrath would actually go to David's house and if he did, why would he go in his car and park outside on the grass verge? The Crown case, it's much like a cheap Easter egg, which is fitting because it's nearly Easter. I don't know why they would use that. But anyway, once you pinch through opportunity, it's hollow in the middle and the bits of the shell just start crumbling into a pile, he said. Call it said David did not suddenly go from a big softy to a super ninja, thanks to a few days training as a corrections officer. In explanation to several questions, such as why there was no forensic evidence, Corlett said there was another reason. Michael never showed up that morning and Bimbo did not kill him. That's why. Crown, Prosecu Crown Prosecutor Barnaby Hawes, in his closing address on Monday, told the jury that David had a very clear and obvious motive to harm Michael. One of his children had told him that they had seen Green kissing Michael just a few weeks earlier. A week before Michael vanished, the private security camera system at David's property had been turned off. And we've read before that he was really um, obsessed with the CCTV, so it's really odd that he turned it off. Um, and the Crown said that was no coincidence. Mr Bimbo was either responsible for Michael's disappearance or the victim of an unlikely and otherwise inexplicable combination of circumstances. Hawes told the jury. It's not lightning strike twice in the same place, this is lightning strike in the same place over and over again. The Crown claimed that he had the motive, means and opportunity to carry out the killing. Wow, thank you guys for uh, bearing with me because that really was a long um, 40 minutes of me rattling it on. Um, it's I'll keep updating, but it is likely that there's going to be another trial, um, and I'll keep you informed of what happens with that. I don't know how I feel about it, actually. There's no body, there's no murder weapon, there's no um, forensic evidence. I know there's a lot of circumstantial evidence, but sometimes... And if you put all of those circumstantial evidence bits together, it, it, it is quite strong, but there's just things that you know, beyond a reasonable doubt. I don't know if I, if I could say that, that I think he's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. But I'm not in the trial. Maybe I should go to the trial next time and actually go in. That would be interesting. Please, uh, anything description box below, anything you need to know, uh, or if you need to donate, they're down there too. Please join me on my next video. I'm enjoying being back with you guys doing uh, live streams about people missing and stuff around the world doing my streams uh, and videos for New Zealand as well um, loving it enjoying having a good time but it's a lot of hard work <laughs> I'll see you in the next one bye guys